G'day legends and welcome back to the Cricket Mentoring Show. As always, I've got my man Reedy here today. How are you Reedy? Yeah, very well, thanks man. Excellent, and we've got a special guest with us today, one of our CM athletes, one of our CM mentors and leading run scorer in the WACA competition this year, Sam Fanning. How are you, Fanners? Cheers, yeah, very good, boys. Thanks for having me on, always a pleasure. Yep, so Fanners has uh, the most runs which we're gonna talk about, his stats a little bit later, but also a former Australian under 19 World Cup squad member and a WACA rookie contracted member. So great to have Fanners with us today. Now, getting into the show, let's uh, talk about what's going on. Really, what's going on in world cricket at the moment? Um, the, the Ashes wrapped up. Um, it was a pretty, pretty exciting test in the end, wasn't it? I think um, it's what the series needed to finish, like, to finish it off. Um, I think a bit of a tighter game, it was good. Um, the pink ball always brings some action, doesn't it? Under the lights. Yeah, well, we uh, got our tips a bit wrong. You said Kawaja <laughs> was going to get runs. I said <laughs> Smith was going to get runs. And neither really eventuated. Travis Head was the star, wasn't he? Yeah, he was great. It was unreal to see him go out and just play fearless cricket on a deck that was doing a lot. It was great for cricket and good that Australia could uh, get the win for now. Yeah, what I, I read an article about how Tri Pat Cummins has really backed Travis Head and just said that we want him to play his way. We want him to play really positive cricket. And I think they've done that with David Warner for many years. They understand, and I think that's where I think Perth Cricket Club have gone with you, is that they understand that there may be the odd dismissal that can be set perceived as a bit soft or can be sort of let the team down at the time. But over a period of time, that's how Travis Head's going to play his best cricket. Would you agree? Yeah, I think if you're just consistent in that approach, then no one can accuse you of anything. Like if he plays that approach, whether he's in England, whether he's in Australia, then yeah, he's going to have pretty positive outcomes, I reckon. So it's good to see him play that way and play his natural game and select his back him in. Because um, it's so easy for people to go into their shell. But yeah, it's so good to see him go out and play fearless cricket. Score a runnable 100 on a grand seam is pretty tough. So yeah, it's great I think, to see. I think Marnus's role in that, in that innings, that first innings was very crucial as well, obviously. Um, sort of him and Head rescued the, the innings when they were three for not many and Marnus went at a good clip. They realised that if they hung around they were probably going to get out and have a ball with their name on it so they just took the game to the palms a bit. I think that's where Marnus is seriously underrated. His ability to go up and down the gears. Um, we've seen in the big bash he can go very easy, go more, more than a run of ball and take the game away from teams. So um, that's where that's where the really good players go to a new level, I think. And they were able to assess the conditions and, and work out what's needed when and not just keep the same plan regardless of what's going on in the game. Now, Reedy, you're the South Africa versus India correspondent and expert. Yeah. What's been happening over there? Um, the South Africans started the one day series well. Um, it was a bit of a slow wicket in Pal, I think that's how you pronounce it. And uh, they put on a good score and, and um, Runs on the board was the key in that game on a really slow wicket, and um, there's a, they got a few lucky wickets along the way. Coley looked in ominous touch, um, and then just missed time to sweep. And um, yeah, I think that sets up the rest of the series to be a really exciting one. Um, and I think the next next game's tonight, so that'll be good. Yeah, Francis, you been paying attention to what's going on over there? I haven't been actually, but that leads us. Uh, really well and something we'll talk about later the importance of spin bowling it sounds like there's probably lots of spin bowling being uh, bowled on those slow decks so the importance of playing that well I reckon is key I'm not sure how many overs of spin were bowled but I should yeah, yeah well, they've got my hodge and guys like that but there's lots of off pace stuff too mm. um, so again being able to go up and down the gears against that sort of stuff is where the best players are yeah I uh, just googled to try and get his name right but Rassi van der Dussen he scored a hundred. He smashed them, and I saw something that of players who have scored over a thousand ODI runs, he's got the best average. He averages seventy in ODI cricket, wow. and he did it against a pretty full strength Indian side. I think he got a better than a run of ball. One hundred and twenty nine not out. He must be some player. I haven't seen a lot of him. I can't sort of comment, but he must be some player. Yeah, from what I've seen, he's taken a lot of the responsibility on. Him on his own shoulders, and um, he wants to be the guy to turn South African cricket around, um, along with guys like Bavuma and that who are senior players. Um, Vanderdusen is, yeah, he, he can just see he really grits his teeth and has a crack for his country, so I think that's exactly what they've needed. And in last week's show, we spoke about Coley being back in form, he got 51. 
but the elusive hundred is still mm-hmm. yet to come. And I feel like once he gets one and he gets that monkey off his bat, he reminds it back, he reminds himself what to do, the floodgates will open and the, the great Virat will be back scoring big runs again. And that's what we all want to see, isn't it? We want to see Virat getting the runs, so exactly. fingers crossed. Exactly. So the women's Ashes started last night, a comprehensive victory by Australia. I think England posted a pretty good score, 169, pretty competitive score, but the Aussies absolutely bossed it, led by Talia McGrath. We're going to talk a little bit more about that shortly, but uh, Australia, yeah, it's going to be a good Ashes series, and again, something that you're you, going to speak about is it's tough to win away, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. I think I saw, I actually saw Taylor, Taylor Bellini, her first over, and she hit Tammy Beaumont in the head and like bowled rockets and really set the tone. I think that's when they would have put in on the back foot early on and um, sent a message early. Yeah, nice. Well, it's going to be really hotly contested Ashes series. Obviously, the women's Ashes is set up a bit differently than the men's. There's ODIs, there's T20s, and then there's the Test match. So looking forward to seeing how that progresses and we'll talk about that a little bit more. But the Under-19 World Cup, Fanners, you're a former, you went to the last Under-19 World Cup a couple of years ago. Um, England are looking good. They're looking like one of the teams to beat. I think Bangladesh were the number one ranked side going into the tournament and England bowled them out for 90 odd, chased it down, three down pretty easily and then they, they pumped the UAE. The Aussies, our boys, um, uh, two and one with win- win- victories over the West Indies and the other night over Scotland, but a loss to Sri Lanka. What are your thoughts on the World Cup, Fanners? Have you been paying attention to that? Yeah, yeah I've been checking in a lot, obviously, with a few WA boys, Cooper and Teague. Um, yeah, I think it's just great to watch. Obviously, I was there two years ago, and then you see like the next crop coming through, like some of the future stars of the world game. Yeah, I think it's great to see. You see some unreal players with some great talent. Um, obviously great to see our boy Teague doing really well I'm sure you'd be really happy about that yep. um, but yeah it's just great to see the next the future stars and, and give our viewers um, a bit of an insight into your group those that may not know who are your play, or players that some people may know who have gone on to play a bit of um, professional cricket yeah so um, some of the big names Jake Fraser McGurk playing with the Renegades who took that great catch the other night um, Oliver Davies playing with the Thunder Mackenzie Harvey with the Renegades as well and then a few other players kind of just in and around the state squads um, yeah, training really hard and then I'm sure they'll get a game get a game soon enough. A couple of good spinners, Tanvir and Murphy. Yeah, Tanvir Sanger, Todd Murphy. Um, so there's yeah, some really good players that have gone on to do really good things so far um, at the start of their career, which is so good to see. Obviously, being good friends with them and see them kick on is, is great. And yourself as well. And, and it's, a, it's just a springboard for um, domestic and then international cricket. I heard a... When I was watching the cut live coverage of the Aussies' first match against the West Indies, they said that 26% of players who play in the Under-19 World Cup go on to play ODI cricket. Wow. So it's a pretty wow. few, one in four. So if you yeah. if you get into that Under-19 World Cup, there's a for whatever country you've got a pretty good chance. Not everyone, obviously, 30, 75% don't. But yeah, fingers crossed. Um, our boy T is one of those 24%. Oh, 26%, whatever I just said. So, moving on to the Big Bash. Wells, he's back in some form. You been watching much Big Bash, Reed? Uh, honestly, I haven't. <laughs> because, as we've said in the last episode, there's too many games on and I can't keep up. And, but, let's be honest, Wells is never too far away from some form. And you'd know this more than anyone at the moment, fan as being his teammate. Um, yeah, the guy just loves scoring runs. And loves being the guy to get it done, get the team over the line when... They're under pressure as well, I think. Yeah, he just he flies under the radar, doesn't he? Yeah, he's a quiet achiever, but yeah, whenever he's like got a few low scores, you know, a big scores just around the corner. He's just so hungry all the time, no matter who he's playing. For Perth, when we play with him, or he's playing for the strikers, he's just always so hungry, which is which is great to see. And he's he's a smart batter. He's not the biggest. He's not the strongest. Looking at the stats at the moment, he's fifth on the runs for the tournament. Um, he's only hit eight sixes. The guys ahead of him have hit 17, 16, 12, and Ben McTurn's hit an incredible 29 sixes this year. Wells, he's hit eight. So he's a smart batter. He knows his strengths. He knows how to manipulate and maneuver certain types of bowls. And after a little bit of a slow start, he's now fifth on the runs this season. And also, I think he's moved up to fifth in the all-time runs in the Big Bash. So incredible effort from Wellsy. Um, great to see him getting it done. but. What are your thoughts? Do you want the strikers to go all the way or do you want them to get knocked off and him to come back and join Perth pretty soon? Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? I, 
I want the Scorchers to go all the way. So if that means Scorchers strike as final, then so be it. But yeah, Scorchers are first preference. Very diplomatic. <laughs> we want. The, I think we want the Strikers to get knocked over, and then Wellesley comes back to Perth and yeah. Perth with a flag. But, um, on that note, on that note. <laughs> Big game tomorrow. Fanning Huge against game. Reed, Perth <laughs> against Melville. You first, Fanners. What's the predictions for this game? What's going to happen in the next took over the next couple of weekends? Well, I think it depends on what Reedy bowls. If he's bowling <laughs> off spin, he could change the game. But if he's bowling meds, I don't know. Could be fill your boots. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Reedy? There is absolutely no doubt it could be fill your boots if I'm bowling. <laughs> but um, I think it's yeah, it's a crucial game from both teams and. I think both teams are in form, which is good, and that's what you want in these big games. You want to really test yourself, and Perth have a lot of experience in there, and we're a bit younger, and um, yeah, I think we just have to back ourselves. It's not much else we can do, playing at Fletcher Park, so yeah. Well, Perth, I think a third, Melville a fifth or sixth. Mm. Melville are in the T21 final, the one-day semi-final, the Colts final. So Melbourne have done fantastically well in white ball at all sort of levels. Perth have won their last five, so it is going to be led by our man Fanners with back-to-back hundreds. So it's going to be a crucial game, and I think the two left-handers at the top of the order <laughs> are going to play a big part in who gets it done. Hopefully, hopefully Fanners doesn't continue the white ball form into red ball, so hopefully that gives us some more of a chance against the <laughs> Well, from my point of view, I hope you both get runs and there's a little Perth victory, but we'll yeah. uh, <laughs> see how it pans out now. You've changed. Fanners, <laughs> Fanners, what have you noticed in world cricket or in cricket in recent times? Um, I've noticed a lot of spin being bowled. Obviously in the Big Bash, um, lots of international mystery spinners, um, lots of spinners from Australia. I reckon there's 10 and 10 overs of the 20 overs being bowled, which is spin. I think it's, yeah, it's something that's slowly come into the game and it's just taken off in the last couple of years with um, Big Bash and you know, T20 cricket all around the world. So I think the importance of playing spin and being able to get off strike again spin, having a scoring option is, is huge. Because you see so many people get bogged down. Um, you need to have, yeah, a good shot. If it's a sweep shot, coming down the wicket, getting, um, using the depth of your crease. I think you need to have a good scoring option against spin. Absolutely, and, and T20 cricket, everyone thought, would be the death of spinners, but mm. it seems like every club is, is sort of signing overseas spinners these days and having good quality spinners, not just part-timers, is, is crucial to a team's success. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but you, yeah, you just have to have options. There's no other choice anymore, is there? I think, yeah, that's why it's so important to have your sweep shots off a good length or if you can come down the wicket. Because if you can't sweep, then the bowler can settle in. They know you can only go forward or back. So that's why, like, obviously you practice sweep shot with lots of your clients. I think, yeah, it's so important. Mm. You need to have a sweep shot. And to me as well, like, as you said, you want to be re- have a really real confidence in one of the options, but you also want to be able to get use your feet and get back. If you can play all of them and you can play with the bowler's length, well, then that gives you heaps of options. Ready? what have you noticed? Um, yeah, I think... One of the biggest things is that winning away from home is proven to be pretty tough work for everyone. Um, I think I think it's gonna be proven again. Like we always have to go to Pakistan this year, and I think that's gonna be really tough. And talking about having options to spin um, in the subcontinent, we know it offers a bit there. So um, yeah, I think it's gonna be interesting in the future years how countries travel and how they prepare, start preparing. Because at the moment it's even India in South Africa against a lesser team are, are struggling. Yeah, well, it's and, and the women's Ashes is the same. The English playing in Australian conditions, it's so different, and it is underrated how different the conditions are. And when if you're you've grown up playing your cricket in Australia, um, if you suddenly go to India or England or whatever, it's, it's really really different. And whether the big sort of countries start to expose players like you, young, good players who they see as future international players, where they start to expose them at an earlier age to sort of get used to the conditions, understand the, the problems you face and then have to sort of problem solve through that, time will tell. But it, it's it's definitely getting harder and harder and you see less teams winning on the road, don't you? Yeah, definitely. And like, that's why the next Ashes series in England will be so good. See Australia coming off 4-0 and then going over to England, that'd be unreal to see how Australia cope in the English conditions. Absolutely, and that's a real test of the Aussies' techniques, because the ball does move around a bit over there. And 
For me, what I've noticed is similar to the men with the Aussie men where Bowloon came in, Kawaja came in and they did well. The Aussie women look like they have lots of depth. They actually left out Elise Perry from the T20 International last night, one of the greatest female players ever. And they, Beth Mooney's injured. She sort of got the incident to her jaw and they, they still got it done. So to me, the WBBL must be producing some, some high quality cricket and, and they have some real depth. So that's great to see. And, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see where the series progresses to, but awesome to see that the, the, depth, the depth of Australian cricket in the women's game is excellent. Fanners, what have you enjoyed? Um, something I've enjoyed is uh, seeing Greeny, um, obviously a teammate, overcome some probably technical issues that he had at the start of the season, uh, sorry, start of the series, and a few people made a few comments and he kind of went back to the, his... Um, coaches that he trusts and that he has in his close bubble and then obviously performing so well at the back end of the series was just unreal to see obviously with the ball he's been consistent all throughout the series but then with the bat it was just so good to see him come through get a few big scores and like we talked about before most get uh, player of the series so it was amazing to see him take on some feedback and then learning so quickly yeah i think he's the other thing is as well he's starting to find confidence in his body and you could see in his bowling, he's bowling real aggressively and, and really letting it go. And I think that's the most exciting, one of the most exciting things in Australian cricket at the moment. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And, and have, like you say, having people you trust is so important. He's got his little sort of circle. Obviously, there was some, a bit of criticism from Ricky Ponting or his observations were that his technique was a bit off. He was very open and coming across the ball a bit. That got fed back to the Aussie squad and to the Cam Green came out and said afterwards, he took that advice on the board, it was passed on to the people he trusts, they problem solved, they worked through it, and he was getting in much better positions. And to me, as we always talk about, that's what the best players do. They're always trying to problem solve, always trying to tinker and fix things. You were doing that, even though you're scoring runs at the moment, you were doing that last night, throwing your balls, you're trying to fix things and play with things just to continue to make sure you're not only better this weekend, but you're able to handle higher quality bowling in the future. So. Very good to see um, Cam Green, WA boy, your teammate, going well. Gee, he's going to be hard to sort of... He's going to be one of the greatest players of all time, I reckon. If he can stay fit and he can keep on rockets and, and start scoring some runs, he's a, he got, a, got everything. Um, Ready? What, what have you enjoyed? it? Um, bit of a Melville bias here, but the, the boys, we got over, got over the line in the T20 semi-final on the weekend to book a... Spotted the Wacker against Subi, Subiaco Flora in the grand final. Um, we managed to knock off a really good Frio side who have like, had a consistent team for a long time now. They know, they know how to go about T20 cricket and they had some really good informed players. Um, but for a few of our young guys to stand up and um, get us over the line at the end in a, in a run chase, a tight run chase, I thought... That was, yeah, it was epic. And the, the celebration as we got the final run it, like, really showed and how much we wanted it. And um, no, it's, yeah, it's exciting. Well, you uh, you won the quarter final in the morning to book your spot in the semi, and you got a few runs in that game, didn't you? You got the boys <laughs> over the line. Yeah, that's not for me to discuss. <laughs> Little cheeky 20 not out to win the quarter final. And then a couple of our mentors, young mentors, Coiny and Wheels, got got the job done in the afternoon, who were both playing in the Colts final as well. So congrats to Reedy and the Melville boys on that and good luck for the final in a couple of weeks, which I know that we'll be talking about. For me, what I've enjoyed, Teague Wiley getting it done over in the World Cup. Our boy, Teague, I've been sort of working with since he was 13, five years or so, um, and 86 not out in the first game. I actually said on last week's show, I didn't have high expectations for him thought it was going to be incredibly challenging for him. He's more of a red ball player than a white ball player. It's going to be spinning over there, but he's a young man who just finds a way. He just hangs in and stays in. 86 not out in his first game, and then 101 not out in his third game. Missed out in the middle game against Sri Lanka, but I've really, really enjoyed that, um, which we will talk a little bit more about shortly. And I've also enjoyed seeing Talia McGrath, man, player of the match last night, um, and Alan King, obviously Kingy, was one of the mentors at our female winter academy last year she has come on in leaps and bounds in the last sort of 12 months had an awesome wbbl so really pleased for her to make her debut yesterday and get her first wicket 
And Tali McGrath, um, I've seen her Instagram account pop up on our Instagram on our stories as a viewer for a while now. We've had a tiny bit, sort of a few conversations here and there, and so yeah, really pleased to see her doing well. I sent her a message saying well done, and she she replied saying thank you. So congratulations to Tali McGrath, and great to see her doing doing so well and, and Australia dominating. This was a bit of a hard one this week. What haven't we enjoyed, Fanners? Yeah, that was a tough one. Um... I think with us all being in WA, obviously we want to watch some cricket, we want to see some live cricket, and yeah, for us it's been a, a little bit frustrating not to see the Scorchers obviously doing so well over East, but we just haven't been able to watch them at Optus Stadium, a great stadium for like cricket, footy, everything, and yeah, we can't watch um, some of the WA born and bred players, which is a little bit frustrating, um, and then obviously we, we're going to have the last test match as well, which would have been great to see, obviously then win the Ashes, um, like Greeny lift the trophy, um, lift the end, sorry, um, in, um, yeah, on his home, in his home state. So it's been a little frustrating. Um, so yeah, it's probably something we haven't enjoyed with us being a little WA biased. Yeah, for me, this, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw this. Um, we don't know what happened before the video was taken, I guess, and what sort of noise they were putting on, but um, yeah, the police haven't put an end to the Ashes party on the rooftop, <laughs> I think. Um, we all, like us three in particular, we all they'd love to celebrate a good win, and um, I'm sure we would have been in the same position if we won an Ashes, but um, that's what it's all about, and I think for that to have to end, for those boys that are still in their whites, their baggy green, um, mixing it up with Joe Root and Jimmy Anderson, how good's that, like, that's just what dreams are made of, really. And um, for guys like Travis Head, Alex Carey's first series, um, yeah, that's that's just the dream. And for that to get put to an end, the sun was up, but I'm sure they would have gone <laughs> for another night if they could have. So, um, yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I don't think it would have taken winning the Ashes for us to stay. Right <laughs> uh, I think if you win the T20 final, you might be doing something similar. But book the week off. Thanks. They're, for that. they're the. Uh, they're the sort of memories you make and you remember forever, isn't it? Just sort of sitting around having a drink. Joe Root, one of the world's best ever players, and, and Jimmy Anderson. And then Nathan Lyon and Joe Root are great mates. They played club cricket together in Adelaide. Um, and so the, you saw them sort of talking a lot throughout the series. And, and yeah, they would have just been enjoying each other's company, sharing some stories, sharing some thoughts on the game. And, and yeah, it was a bit disappointing. Obviously, they had a good night. Sun was up. But... Yeah, love seeing them still in their whites, which is which is great. Um, Fanny's thoughts on that one? Yeah, well, that's why we play cricket, isn't it? Celebrate <laughs> after. Yeah, no matter. Yeah, obviously it's you always want to win, but it's about yeah, you create great friends and like you said, Rude and Lion, they obviously played in LA together and now they're playing in the Ashes against each other. So yeah, you create great friends from cricket on and off the field. Um, yeah, and it's just it's great to see that happening. You're the night captain at Perth, aren't you? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> is always leading the charge. For me, talking about late nights, I haven't enjoyed the late nights staying up and watching Teague. Um, Friday night, they lost the toss, or they won the toss and bowled. Oh, they lost the toss and bowled first, and then so I started, game started at 9pm. I ended up going to bed at 4.30am. Teague sort of started his innings about 12.30 or 1am. And then he batted through the innings and I, I couldn't go to sleep while he was still in. And then the other night, I actually went to bed about 10 o'clock, they were fielding. But I woke up at 2.30, I was curious, checked the score, saw that he was on some runs, he was about 70 and I, I sort of couldn't sleep. So I got up, watched it. So it's been a, a bit of a sleep deprived week. So I haven't been enjoying that, but all, obviously well worth it. And also a bit of a funny one, this one. Fanners, you've got some thoughts on this, but mm. Steve Smith not being allowed to play in the BBL finals. It's a bit of a sort of grey area. He wasn't contracted by the Sixers, um, whereas others were contracted by their franchises. But for me, I haven't enjoyed that. Surely you want the best players playing in the finals. There was meant to be an Australia series. There's not now. I just read an article that it wouldn't happen to LeBron James or sort of one of the best players in other franchises. They'd be, they'd be sort of wanting to them to play. So a bit of a strange one. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, tough one. Obviously you want the best players playing. Steve Smith, Playing in the Big Bash brings so many people through the gates. Crowd, um, crowds will be bigger, better cricket will be played. Um, yeah, I think it is a tough one, but it's unfair on a few of the other teams as well. Um, obviously, if they've signed some players and the Sixers not signing Steve Smith, um, it's a bit of a yeah, free ride for the Sixers. And then 
the other clubs have signed all these players, paid a lot of money for these players, and then yeah, they're almost getting Steve Smith for free. Which um, from a watching the game point of view, a fan, it's oh, you want Steve Smith there, but yeah, you can see from a list point of view and um, with yeah franchise point of view, it's pretty tough on them. So yeah, I'm probably on the fence there. It's a tough one. Yeah, well, time will tell. I guess that he's, it seems like he's not going to play. And Moses and the the Sydney boys are a bit disappointed in it, but yeah, you can understand the frustrations from the other squads who have contracted their players at the start of the series um, and then had to pay them their wage or whatever and then they come back after the Australian series ends but Smith sort of swans in but yeah a bit, bit of a strange one now moving on to our value topic of the week Fanners we're going to pick your brain a bit and try and understand you and your game and what is behind your success this year obviously this is your third year in Perth now I think um, yeah First year, you were away a lot. Two years ago, you were away a lot. You didn't play a lot of cricket. You had a bit of an injury, and then you went away for the World Cup. Last year, you were finding your feet. You played some good innings. You, you did some good things. But this year, you've, you're the best player in the comp. You've scored some incredible runs, which we'll talk about and get going to in a minute. But what is it that's sort of making you so successful this year? I think this year, the main thing that I focus on is just trying to say process-driven. Like, if results happen, then that's great, but I can't really control that. I've been trying to focus just staying on my processes, doing what I can control, because I can't control other things out of like the bowling attack, whatever, um, those external factors control what I can control. And then if results happen, great. Um, if not, then obviously that's frustrating, but if I'm f- focusing on my processes, um, then yeah, I think results will happen more often than not. But I think it's being consistent with those processes. It's not. If I do something and I get a duck, I need to change something. I'm still just going to back them in. So I may go 100-100, I may go duck-duck. But just, yeah, trying to be as consistent as possible. Um, and something that, like, we, you talk about a lot is, like, staying in the contest. Felt like last year I would get in the contest and then I would get out a lot for 30 and 40. So this year I would try to get in the contest and then stay in the contest for a long period of time. And then after, like, I'm staying in the contest, I want to win the contest. So I want to come off hitting the running or winning runs where I want to come off, not out. So I think that's, I've had those two points of, I've really tried to nail this year. And so last year, were you a bit more results driven and sort of Definitely, needing yeah. to get runs, wanting to prove yourself to people and like too desperate for runs, I suppose? Yeah, I was almost too hungry for runs. I was so like, oh, I need to get runs every Saturday. So then it would get to Wednesday, oh, I want to get runs Thursday, I want to get runs Friday. And it would just be almost information overload. Like, I'd be, like, so fixated on it, where this year, like, obviously that's the outcome, but I can't control that. So, I guess, yeah, I'm going to stay focus-driven, uh, process-driven, and then, yeah, if results happen, great. Um, but, yeah, it's definitely so easy when you're out of runs, you just want to make runs. But, yeah, you just want to control what you can during the week, and then on Saturday, just get in the contest. And I feel like if you're in the contest, then if you stay in it for long enough, things will happen. Give us a bit of an insight into your process on game day. So, coming to the ground, what are you sort of thinking about? What are you trying to sort of visualise or how are you trying to be at the, sort of in the morning of the game? And then going into the contest, walking out to bat, your first 10 balls, etc. Give us a little bit of a picture of that. Yeah, so I think when I'm, it's a Saturday when I'm playing a game, um, it's Sam the cricketer. Like, um, all throughout the week it's sound the person I like live my normal life but then for me to get my best success and better results is be by being sand the cricketer so I think for me that I go into I'm not being friends with the opposition like I'm just focusing on my mental space and for me that's just when we find out we're batting I'm like fully switched on to I have a look at their bowling attack like if they're warming up I go like have a look at um few other bowlers, see if there's a few different actions, just so it's not totally fresh when I go out to the middle. Um, and then I'll grab a few underarms and then a few throwdowns, but that's just to, for me mainly to get my trigger, um, my trigger moving in the right position. And I find like from throwdowns, lots of people get annoyed if they don't hit them good, like, oh, they get a bit frustrated, but I find for me it's a win-win. Like if I hit them bad, I'm, I'm due to hit them good in the game. And if I hit them good, I'm gonna hit them good in the game. Like it's totally irrelevant. Like. I'm only doing it to get my feet moving. So to be honest, it doesn't, that doesn't really affect me at all. And then I go back into the sheds and I take a few deep breaths, um, say a few things to me, um, to myself, just to get me switched on, like 
a bit like a bit of a um, MJ last dance when I watched that Michael Jordan he like tries to get himself up like picks a fight with someone in the opposition to find some motivation so I've tried that a bit this year which has been which has been pretty good um, so yeah I've try to do that like 10 minutes before I go out and then I'm fully like focused on getting in the battle and then yeah before I cross the white line I'm just saying to myself get in the contest stay in the contest and then win the contest um, and that's just me being Sam the cricketer like I can be Sam the person every other day of the week I'm like friendly like easy going but I'm Sam the cricketer when I'm, when I'm at cricket No I think that's interesting how he identifies himself differently um during the week he's just yeah he's not not judging himself by how he's hitting him or um, what he's doing in cricket or anything like that he's just trying to live live and be himself and I think that's probably putting you in the most comfortable like the best mindset um, you possibly can be um, and then yeah I, I really enjoy how you talk about winning the contest there um, and, and how you're competing a lot harder um, I think that's something that has always helped me and um, I think, yeah, I think that can really set the difference from that's the best players are like so driven and so competitive and just want even te- they want to be better than their teammates. Some of them, you know what I mean. So, um, no, that's, that's awesome. But take us inside during your weeks. You talk about your processes. What what about your training week? How's that? Like, how are you whacking balls all the time, or are you sometimes you lay off, or how does that look? Yeah, so it's been a bit different. Like these last two weeks, I've I've had a little bit of a back injury, so I haven't actually hit that many balls during the week. And I've kind of come to Saturday just being really f- like really fresh. To be honest, even a little bit underdone, I was a little bit worried. Um, but I said like I can't control what I do during the week if I've got an injury. Like it was actually a really good challenge for me to come to Saturday. I've had a bit of an injury. I've had one hit during the week. Would rather hit three or four times as many times as possible. But to to get on Saturday, like I did exactly the same processes, like found my motivation for that game, um, and then just switched on and tried to bat as normally as I could. Um, and then, but normally if I have a normal week, I'm hitting Tuesday, Thursday, and Tuesday's a slightly more technical focus because it's a bit earlier in the week. So if I found like, for example, I'm falling over my trigger, or um, like I was a bit, like my defense wasn't as solid as what I wanted, I'd probably go bowling machine a little bit earlier in the week. Um, just try to get that in then, and then Thursday, Friday, a bit more getting the contest focused. Like, I'm just facing the bowler, it's like a game. Um, so that way, I'm still like chipping away at my technical stuff. So that will help me in good stead for five years, 10 years. Mm-hmm. So it's not just, oh, I'm in season, I'm just going to hit balls, I'm going to focus on finding the middle. Still want to work my technical area. And then, yeah, Thursday, Friday is more getting the contest, um, try to prepare myself for the weekend. And so, how do you get away from cricket being Sam the person? How, what, what's, what do you do to switch off? And Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I love playing golf. So, yeah, I try to play that Friday Arvo lunchtime. So, from like midday to five o'clock, I'm playing around a golf. Um, I'm just completely switched off, not thinking about cricket. Because um, it's so easy on Friday afternoon, you're playing Saturday. You're just thinking about cricket all the time. So, yeah, I try and play golf Friday Arvo and then um, go out for dinner with like teammates or whoever on a Friday night so then I'm totally switched off um, yeah like going to the beach like going out having a good time with the boys um, yeah, it's always good after a win to go and have a good night out I think that's you definitely need that as a player and as a cricketer you can uh, you can bat all day for 200 or you can stick off first ball but if your team wins then there's nothing better than going out and have a good time yeah so what I think is a really important point from what you said, it's something that Teague's been through over in the West Indies, is you can't always control your preparation. And I've had a few conversations with Teague. He was a bit frustrated with the facilities that they've been given for, for training and they've um, had a lack of the ability to hit lots of balls. And Teague, similar to you, loves hitting balls, loves hitting balls and usually hits thousands of balls a week. And he's been not able to do that because of facilities and COVID and whatever else over in the West Indies. So he's had to get to the game and convince himself that he's okay. Mm. Convince himself that he's ready and he'll be okay, even though he's underdone, even though he's not had his normal preparation, which you last week, you were uncertain on Thursday night if you were even going to play. You had to see how your back was going to be. You hadn't really trained all week. 
and I know your back was really stiff and sore for the first sort of part of your innings and you, you sort of took a few risks, had a bit of luck, which you need, um, but then it loosened up and you, it sort of came good. And that's something I think a lot of young players need to learn is that if you're playing international cricket or you've got ambition to play at the highest level, you can't always prepare exactly how you want to prepare. You can't just walk to the nets and have someone, your coach come and throw for you, or your dad come and throw for you. You might be in an underage tournament and you just can't, you don't actually have the ability, but you've got to still get your mind into the contest and be ready, don't you? Yeah, and I think that's great for like, for the, all the players coming back from Big Bash at the moment. They come from Big Bash trying to clear the ropes and then a week later they've got a shield game. Like it's so hard, you're going from white ball, white ball, and then you've got a week to prepare for shield cricket. Like it's so hard to transition, but it's something you can't control and you just need to live with, especially with COVID around um, this day and age. Like you may have COVID for a, for a couple of days, you're in isolation. And then like, I think Joe Clark came out and played the next day and he got 80. So sometimes it's actually can be really refreshing, but like you said, you can't, you can't control that. So you can only control the controllables and do what you can do. Um, but I think it's all about your mindset. Like, if you go out to bat thinking you're good enough, knowing, convincing yourself that you can perform, then I think you can face whatever attack, even if technically you're not in the best space, maybe tactically, but if your mindset is there, then I think, yeah, you hold yourself in a good position to do well. Yeah, and that's exactly what our message was to the girls at our camp this week was about, your, the, and I say it in all of my talks and to my athletes is the number one skill for any athlete is the ability to focus on the present moment and all you, we are the sum of all of our actions up until that point and if you or Teague or any good young player hasn't hit for a month you've still got years of volume under your belt and you need to convince yourself I'm ready I'm ready for this contest rather than let the anxiety of oh, I haven't hit this week I haven't hit enough overcome you and that's when you start to doubt yourself that's when you start to get distracted from the contest and, and you both have done it very well where you've just said, no, nah, I'm ready, I'm focused, I'm going to take this, this on and, and seize this opportunity. Let's talk a bit now about your game plan because having played with you, having spoken to you a lot about this, but I'll, like, I understand it and know it well, but give our viewers a bit of an insight. You've scored four white ball hundreds this year. All your hundreds in grade cricket have been um, in the white ball 50 over competition. You've also got 100 in the second level in Red Bull, but what's you, the difference between the formats and what, how are you approaching your innings? Yeah, it's well, something I remember like we're at your house um, and in the season last year and talking about like the different game plans, Red Bull, White Bull. I think for White Bull, like I've just played more of it, so I've got such a blueprint that I know exactly what I'm doing. So in the first 10 overs, it's two fielders out, so I look to take advantage of that. For me, that looks like playing with a straight bat um, if I'm looking to go like hit a boundary, it's usually straight over the bowler's head. Give myself every chance with a straight bat to go um, yeah, over their head, maybe get one of their fielders back, or even because it's a pretty easy shot for me, um, presenting the full face. And then, yeah, I'm kind of just knocking it around, looking to put the pressure back on the bowler for those first 10 overs. And if I get out on those first 10 overs doing that, then I can live with that, like I'm fine. Like, get out on the first 10 overs, that's okay. But then from 10 overs, um, over 10 to 40, the 40th over, I'm literally just looking to hit the sweepers hard, like knock the ball around, and I'm looking to play as like, very low risk, um, trying to make all the odds in my favour. Um, usually mid on and off goes back, square leg and um, cover. So there's so many single soft hands one, or you can hit it hard for the sweepers. And then you're going to get a bad ball, you're going to get a full toss, a half tracker. So from um, yeah, that 30 over period, I kind of, I call it like walking the dog. So I'm kind of, taking my, um, my dog on a walk, first 10 overs, he rushes out of the gates, like he's keen to just go out. That's kind of my first 10 overs. Then from 10 to 40, just on the leash, walking all the way around. Um, and then from over 40 to he 50. Really let the dogs out. <laughs> yeah, no, he, um, yeah, just walk around, is chill. And then from over 40 to um, 50 in the last 10 overs, it's, um, it's almost a sprint, like you're rushing back home, you're keen to get back home. so. I'm yeah, looking to walk the dog all the way back home, but I know I can up the ante a little bit. Like I've got a few different shots that I can go to, but something that we've done a lot of Perth this year, like we haven't been great at from overs 40 to 50, um, like where you can get like 80 runs, but we've probably been going more to 40. Um, and I think that's just because we kind of get 40 and we like start looking to clear the ropes, but you kind of keep taking it deeper, taking it deeper. Then from over 45 to 50, it's still 30 balls. You can get. 
50 runs or 30 balls mm. if you've got players in hand. So I think that's my game plan um, and my blueprint for white ball and I'm pretty consistent at it. Um, and I know like last year I got out a bit in the first 10, but I was okay with that. And well, then, you're, yeah. playing, you're playing a bit of a high risk game in the first it's 10. A little and, bit you, more, yeah. and you practice those shots. Mm, so they, yeah. they're your shots. It's not like you're trying to do something outrageous, but yeah. you're hitting the ball in the air. You're taking fielders on, you're taking the quicks on. Yeah. And it means when you get it wrong, you are going to make mistakes. And yeah. something that I think isn't spoken about enough, we mentioned it last week with Coley, is you do you do need a bit of luck. All batters need a bit of luck. And, and you, in, at times, have had balls that sort of land next to fielders or just over the head, but you, that's, you're willing to live with that. You're willing to, as you said, you're willing, you're okay with getting out. And it, then it's just smart batting that once the field goes out, you then sort of rein yeah. it in. But you've worked hard at your plan, haven't you? Yeah, and I feel like a great example against Scarborough this year, like I came down the wicket, hit it straight up, got caught in mid-on, but I haven't got out that way so far. Like I would have hit that 25 times for four or six. So it's something that I can, just, I can live with. Um, but yeah, like you said, I practice that a lot and I try to use my crease a lot to get the bowlers off their length. Like if I'm coming down the wicket, then I'm hoping next ball they drop short. So I'm probably going a little bit deeper in my crease, hoping for a cut or pull shot. But saying that I'm still present, like I'm reacting to the ball. If it is a full ball, I'm gonna still come forward, but I'm trying to, yeah, not predict what the bowler's bowling, but make the odds in my favor, I feel, and get them bowling to how I want them to bowl. Yep. And then I guess moving on to red ball, um, it's just a few different, it's more shot selection, I think. For the first, like, opening spell, you just, you, as an opener, like Buck talks about a lot, you're just looking to get through. Like, your job as an opener is to get through the opening spell. Um, and I think that's my job, first and foremost. But saying that, I'm still looking to hit every ball for four. Every ball I want to hit for four, but then if it's not there, then I work my way down three, two, one, zero. Um, and I just know that obviously the red ball swings a little bit more. So for me, coming down the wicket is not an option. It's more I'm waiting for them to over pitch because um, they'll probably go searching with it swinging and seaming. Um, but I'm trying to have that consistent mindset of I'm always looking to score and then I can work down from that. Because I feel like that's when I get in better positions to defend. But when I'm looking to defend, then I don't get in great positions to attack or defend. And that's where I think Warner has developed mm. his red ball game plan, something we've spoken about coming from an attacking white ball player into red ball cricket is not, and this is where you sort of struggled early in your red ball cricket the last few years, is going too defensive and too survival mode and ending up being two runs off 30 balls and missing out on scoring shots. So it's just managing the sort of tempo a bit, really. Yeah. I'm interested to know you, Reddy, your left-handed open batter, same as founders, but your more on the survive, defend, and then expand from their side of things, aren't you? Yeah, so, yeah, I, I like how you're still keeping the same intent, but that looks different mm. yeah. in terms of a plan. Um, and, like, same for me, I'm trying to have lots of intent, and st- I still know if I get one on my legs or a white half volley, I'm going, because that's, that's my spot. But in red ball, for me, all I'm thinking is just, like still and play it late and everything else seems to then take over from there and like it allows me to track the ball as long as I possibly can and hopefully then make the right decision uh, more often than not but um, yeah I, I'm more about letting the ball come into me into my into my zones and, and just sort of picking them off early um, and wearing the bowlers down trying to leave it. Yeah excellent well it'll be a good test for you tomorrow having played both of you having played a lot of white ball cricket now having to transition back into Red Bull. I think that that is, and you spoke about it last week, that is a reason Red Bull techniques aren't as good anymore. There's mm. less, play, play, batting averages are lower in Red Bull cricket in international, but even probably in grade cricket, because there's so much white ball. You've spent the last two months practicing your power hitting and running down the wicket, yeah. and now you've both got to get back into the mode of letting the ball go and let, absorbing good spells of bowling and still looking to score. That's still your intent but sort of not going after the wrong ball, which is what often happens when you've been playing shots. Yeah. I think that's a great point about absor- absorbing great bowling as well. Like you've got to recognize, it's such a skill to recognize when they're bowling well, when they're on top, which is okay if they're on top, but you just want to get through that patch. And like something we talked about, like you can go two ways, I think. Like you can absorb the pressure, look to get through, you recognize that moment, um, and then you, can, you get through the other side, and then the bowlers come back for second, third, fourth spells. Or you probably go more of like a, 
don't know, a Brendan McCullum approach where you look to fight fire with fire, you look to be a bit more aggressive, get the bowlers off their line of length. So I think for like different players, there's two different approaches, which is great, I think. Um, but yeah, I think I probably now, uh, having learned a bit more, probably want to go down more, I think, just get through because I feel like percentage is a bit more in my favour that way. Um, but I think it's great that some people can go down that other option as well. Yeah. Now, final thing on you, Fanners, before we move into the next segment is what's driving you? Like, will you, to get big scores and to back up week after week, there's, there's something that's driving you. Obviously, you're wanting to get in the WA side and, and go beyond that, but what's, what's your motivation at the moment? Um, I wrote down a few goals, actually, when I was up in Darwin. Um, I was outcome-based, so I was struggling a little bit in Darwin, but I had a really good process. Um, and then me and my mate wrote down a few goals just to hold each other accountable. He's playing in Queensland at the moment. Um, and a few, one of the goals was um, we want to get more hundreds than fifties. So I've kind of had that as a goal this year. Like when I get to 50, I just want to get to 100. Like, and then I want to go on and get big scores. But I think that's a really, like, I wrote down a few goals. Um, one of them was also like, I want Reddit, like second innings runs. Like I want winning runs. Um, cause like Virat Kohli a few years ago, like he went through a passage where if they were batting second, he would be not out at the end. Like he would contribute so much to their, their team winning. Um, so those were two really big goals that I, I could say over in my head, like if I'm out there, if I'm 150, I'm like more hundreds than 50s. And then I guess it's a little bit of a driving focus. Um, so I think it's really important to have, for me to have those goals I did at the start of the year, but I'm not going into the game saying I want to get 100 because of maybe chasing 100. So it's just being present, but having that at the very back of my mind. Um, yeah, I think that just keeps me hungry each game. And then obviously, like you said, wanting to play for WA, but that's something I can't control. So if that happens, then that's great. But yeah, I guess I want to keep putting runs on the board. Well, you're giving yourself every chance and you've, you've done that so far. 400, 150 and 160 in the, at the first game of the year, 130 second game of the year. You've been turning those starts into big scores and your numbers are phenomenal. 782 runs and an average of 71. 250 more runs than the next best, your mate, Jaden Goodwin. Um, so yeah, certainly putting your name forward and that's all you can do, isn't it? Is just keep yeah. knocking the door down and you, your chance will come uh, pretty soon, no doubt, hopefully. Yeah, fingers crossed. Now, Reedy, this is your part of the show. Yeah, we're back <laughs> with the Grinders Club, ladies and gentlemen. And um, this week, we're going to pay some respect to a former grinder, um, probably one of the all-time great grinders. Um, I think any bloke that's nicknamed the wall has to be in the club, <laughs> otherwise it just shouldn't exist, really. And um, this guy had a career strike rate of 42.51 in tests. Test matches, that's right in the wheelhouse, I think. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. and 71.23 in ODIs, which I think tells a story about how cricket's changed. Um, if you're not sort of at that 100 strike rate now in one day cricket, you're probably just falling behind a touch. Um, but yeah, it, looking forward to presenting this cap, cap number five for the <laughs> Grinders Club, um, the Wall Rahul Drab. And so Rahul, Rahul welcome. Um, he's now the coach of India. Um, and yeah, he's looking to bring them back to the, or keep them at the top of their, um, top of the world really. Um, but yeah, I'll, you can, we can all remember watching, you watch Sachin at one end, Rahul Drava holding up the other end for him pretty much. And, um, they com complimented each other so well. Yeah. What a player he was. He got lots of runs in Australia, did well in, against the Aussies and, I think he was as technically correct as, as almost anyone that's played the game. And yeah, now we was working with the underage. He might have been the coach of India at yeah, the last yeah, Monday World Cup. Yeah. He's done amazing things, I think, in Indian cricket with the youth, in their youth system. And now he's obviously the national coach and regarded very, very highly. So, um, Founders, I don't think you'll ever be a member of this club, unfortunately. I know, you, I'm devastated. Yeah. You are. Uh, you, sure you, 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 <laughs> <slogan, man. laughs> you, you take the game on a bit too much. But, um, <laughs> Congrats to Rahul Dravid. Um, now, Fanners, as our special guest, we're going to throw this one over to you. This is a question we got um, from our Instagram in the last couple of weeks is, how to work through challenging periods in innings, in an innings, and avoid getting bogged down? And then someone else, similar sort of question, sort of said how to have more intent when you're batting. Yeah, well, I think that goes into what we said before, like when there's tough periods and you're getting bogged down, there's, yeah, it depends what type of player you are, but there's two ways. I think you can go, you can 
you realize that you're bog getting bogged down and sometimes that's okay because they're bowling well and that's credit to them. Um, so if it's a one day game, they can only bowl 10 overs out of the 50. Um, if it's a Red Bull game, they're gonna go off for a spell and there's gonna be a new bowler come on. So I think realizing that and then that you can get through and that you don't have to score off that certain bowler. You're always looking to score, but sometimes they're bowling well. So yeah, just um, trying to get through that and see what's next because like something that I got told when I was at the under World Cup from Buck was just, you always see what's next, you see what's next because they're gonna get more tired. There's new bowlers gonna come on and it may be a really good matchup. Um, so that's one way that I think you can go about it. Or another way is you can say, if you're getting bogged down, maybe they do have aggressive fields, which means there's a few more gaps. Um, so you can maybe take a calculated risk if he's bowling that hard length, maybe you can look to come down or maybe you can look to use the depth of your crease. Just get one shot away and who knows, that may change. They may change their field, the bowler will go, oh, he's on top of me. Like one shot can change something. So I think it's great that you can go two different ways and it just depends on the game scenario and who the, um, the type of bowler and the type of batter that you are. Yep. Yeah, I think as well, um as you said, it's important to read the game there. And I think particularly in like grade cricket, for example, coming in in the middle overs on pretty slow, low wickets, like it's pretty hard to start for the next guy. Mm -hmm. So in terms of winning the game, you getting out is could actually be pretty costly to the momentum. Um, and you hanging around with the other guy at the other end, have, building a, a partnership is probably more important than throwing it away and then leaving it up to the, your, your middle order or lower order to get it done. Yeah, definitely. And it can sometimes be like wi worrying about the perception of others. Oh, they th they, I need to get it on. My teammates are thinking I'm going slow rather than just going, right, if we get through this period, we've still got eight, nine, ten wickets in the shed, we can catch up. We can catch up. Let's do it together. And really batting in a partnership and saying, you're going well at that end. I'll just hang in and try and get you on strike or whatever rather than being all about yourself and trying to really... Go, sort of work in the partnership with your partner yeah. and and you're always better off being in the middle like if you can just and like you say just be there for one more over take it a little bit deeper if you're in a chase or whatever is sort of the format if you're there you can catch up and it's yeah. it's it's about not panicking it's about taking calculated risk when you need to but I think yeah if you, the, the more the longer a player bats the easier it becomes usually yeah definitely now performances of the week what do we got well, I think yeah, everyone in the world saw this one. Um, Maxwell went bananas for the Stars um, a couple of days ago, a couple of nights ago, against Hobart, um, who sort of put out slightly second string attack. Um, but yeah, I don't know about the tactics of bowling spin to Maxwell on the power play for the first three overs. I think that was just outrageous <laughs> I actually can't wrap my head around what they were doing um, I think Maxwell took Maxwell a few balls to like warm up to it he was like yeah what's going on here and then he just decided no I'm not having this and um, didn't come through for Maxwell yeah I think they made the highest ever BBL score he made the highest individual score and then Big Bad Stoinis came out and absolutely whacked him at the end as he usually does but um, yeah it was just outrageous yeah Unbelievable. I'm, I don't even know what to say. I checked the scorecard because um, I was I was out and I saw 270 in a big bash game. Oh that that was a good score in ODI cricket 15 yeah. years ago. Unreal. That was you'd like win. you'd win 80% yeah. of games in a one ODI. Now to do that in 20 overs, it I don't think it was the best attack in terms of big bash um, what we've seen before. No. But you still got to get them. And I was astonished that Maxwell. And he carried his bat. Maxwell went at 240. Big Stoin went at 241. So let's not underestimate what Stoin did. And if yeah. he'd got in earlier, who knows what the score would have been. Nick Larkin <laughs> got three off seven. And if Stoin had had another seven balls, <laughs> you could have probably added 20 more runs to that. They probably would have been touching 300. Joe Clark did his bit, bit as well at the top. And he's had a fantastic big bash. He's been, after a slow start, I think he got five fifties in a row. And he's bet, proved his worth in the top few runs in the in the competition but yeah some some knock I think it's the third second or third highest t score in T20 cricket ever I think there was a higher score Turkey versus someone <laughs> oh, someone <laughs> versus <laughs> Turkey <laughs> and um, maybe in the another Asian tournament um, I saw ESPN Cricket Info had a post on their Instagram or something anyway 
Yeah, Maxwell and Stein. To, Mo- do, to do that on the MCG as well. That's a like, big ground. It's a massive yeah. ground. Teams struggle to get 150 there usually due to teams bowling into the wicket. So either either they were really on or the Hurricanes just missed a lot. <laughs> yes, well, well so. probably a bit of both. But serious, serious knock. And I'm not sure that we'll see a score like that in the performance no. like that again for some time. No. Moving on to our own athletes, as I've already mentioned, our boy Teague at the World Cup, 86 not out um, against the West Indies and 101 not out. He loves a not out Teague. Um, speaking to him afterwards, he said, do you know what I love? I said, red ink. And he's like, red. Yeah, he goes, <laughs> uh, like, he just loves being not out. And like you said about Coley, Teague loves batting second. It gives him a chance to understand the blueprint of the game and what he needs to do, what strike rate he needs to go at. And he always sets himself to be the man there at the end and get him through, which he does a lot of the time. Um, he missed out in Sri Lanka, opening the, the Sri Lankans opened the bowling with an offie and it sort of skidded on, uh, took the outside edge. It's something he would not be used to at all, but he's just he just seems to know how to get runs. I didn't have high expectations for him. I thought it was, he's the bottom age player. I thought it was going to be super challenging for him, but he just continues to get it done. He got 150 opening, he batted three, you got 100 in that game. Um, so you, you and he put on a big partnership in that second innings, I think. Yeah, um, first innings. First innings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he just keeps going from strength to strength. Another performance of the week is our man sitting across the table here. <laughs> Fanners, 108 of 127. We mentioned you in last week's episode, but you went back to back, even though you had a sore back. <laughs> the back was back in um, 11 matches, 782 runs at 71.9, 400 plus your 100 in second 11. You're probably over it close to 1,000 runs, well, more than 1,000 runs in all formats. Those numbers don't include 2020s. You're lighting it up. And I remember I messaged you last Saturday night and said congrats, but I also said you've got an opportunity to do something really special this year. I I don't know, I can't remember in my sort of 15 years or so of playing grade cricket, I can't remember many guys who had 400s in the season at 11 matches. Guys maybe get 400s. 400 is an amazing year, but that's after 15 or 16 matches or 18 matches, including finals. So we've done it at 11 matches you could potentially get seven or eight hundreds this year and make it really, really special. So just not tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, well done fanners and, and keep doing yeah. what you're doing. Ready, final part of the show is our predictions for this week. What do you yeah, got for so us? So last week we stunk it up with our predictions. Um, I said Kawhi was gonna turn up again and you said Steve Smith was gonna be back in the runs to get another to get a hundred. Um, so it's nil nil still in this department. Um, this week um, or well, tonight, I think India are going to bounce back in the second one day international. Um, they don't lose too many of those ever. So and I think Coley, as we said, is he's in a bit of form, and I don't think he'll throw it away if he gets a chance this time. But I think it's going to be one one at the end of this game. Right, well, I'm going into the big bash. I'm just going to say whoever wins the playoff out of the Strikers and the Hurricanes will beat the Thunder in the next final. I'm going to go even further and say it'll be a Sixers and Scorchers final. I think they're the two best teams. So whoever wins the first game will go through, and I think then the, the loser of that will beat whoever they play. But I think whoever wins out of Strikers and Hurricanes will go th- beat the Thunder. And I'm backing Darcy Short to get some runs. I'm backing Darcy Short to... to get a big innings in one of the next couple of games. That's a big prediction. Yeah. There's a lot there. So, so what are we measuring? <laughs> Fanners, anything for us? Me? Um, I'll go Perth v Melbourne tomorrow. Whoa. What's yeah. your prediction? I'll say... If Reedy comes on to bowl, <laughs> I reckon oh, maybe I'm in 70 and it's maybe a caught behind. You, he's going to get you out. <laughs> yeah, I reckon he gets me out. You can't predict. <laughs> I'll be on early than that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's going to wrap up our show, fans. Thank you very much for joining us. Our second show of the Cricket Mentoring Show, our second episode. And it's been great to sort of have you give us a bit of insight into what's making you so successful this year. Hopefully there's no doubt there's a bit of value for our, our younger viewers and listeners um, to learn and implement a few things from what you're doing. So... Best of luck tomorrow, both of you. I'll be uh, following very closely. I might try and get down and watch one of the two left-handers have a crack and hopefully both of you do very well. Ready? anything to wrap up? No, no, I thought Sam's insight was unbelievable. And um, yeah, thanks for being here, mate.
Nah, cheers, cheers guys. Tomorrow. Thank you very much for having me and good luck tomorrow. <laughs> cheers, legends. <laughs>